Welcome to this special podcast of the Roundtable Inclusive Recruitment in Studios, a roundtable which took place on February 28, 2022 at Anima, the Brussels International Animation Film Festival, as part of Future Anima, our industry events. This roundtable was co-organized with the Cluster Screen Brussels, with Mediarte and Amplo, and seeing the relevance of this team of inclusivity, we wish to share this podcast in anticipation, of course, of upcoming roundtables on similar subjects. Are there inclusive recruitment practices in the animation film sector in Belgium? How can gender diversity and equality be stimulated? How does gender inclusive recruitment influence the content of the projects? and the well-being at work. What does it actually bring to the studios? So what's the benefit for studios to practice inclusivity? Several personalities from the Belgian animation sector met up to try and answer these questions. We had Alexandra Mese, line producer and HR at Beanuts, Perrine Gauthier, producer at Touristar, Alexandra Mores, lecturer at Digital Arts and Entertainment in Kortrijk and a member of the VAF Commission for Animation. Jeanne Branfaux, head of the Centre du Cinéma et de l'Audiovisuel, le CCA. And Vicky van Bellingen, project officer, welfare and inclusion at Mediarte. The roundtable was moderated by Ali Weiss, who is an ethics coordinator in international game development at Digital Arts and Entertainment in Kortrijk. Let's dive right into the discussion with Ali Weiss introducing her fellow panelists at this roundtable, Inclusive Recruitment in Studios. We will dive into quite a few questions about inclusive recruitment and animation. Uh, and then at the very end, we'll make sure to include some time for you all. If you have any questions or if you would even like to share about your own experiences so then we can all come away from here with some nice food for thought. Uh, this is it about me. I'll have our wonderful panelists introduce themselves. Uh, you might notice that we are all female. Um, so with the topic of inclusive recruitment, I'd really like to point out that this was not intentional. Uh, we did have, unfortunately, a couple panelists that couldn't make it here today. Um, so we had a, a male panelist who, unfortunately, is not here. Also, uh, Anne Pfeiffer from VOF. Uh, she was also supposed to be here, but unfortunately could not make it. So just to let you know, um, yeah, this all-woman panel was not intentional, even though they're very lovely. And you'll see that this afternoon, but just a, a PSA there. Anyway, I'll have our awesome panelists introduce themselves and then we will get into the discussion. Take this weird stuff. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Jeanne Brinfaux. I'm the head of the Cultural Film Fund, which is called the CCA, Centre du Cinéma et de l'Audiovisuel. So it's the Cultural Film Fund for the French speaking part of the country. And in the Flemish part, there is the WAF, and unfortunately, Anne couldn't be here today. But uh, those are the two film funds that are basic, basing their support schemes on artistic and um, quality of the script and scenario, and, uh, and not only on, um, I would say, regional expenses and uh, financial effects. Nice to be here. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Vicky van Bellingen. I, jo I joined Mediarte, the um, social fund of the Belgian audiovisual film and digital industry, a couple of months ago, and I'm focusing there on inclusivity and well being. Hello, I'm uh, Alexandra Mores, and I'm a 3D animator. And I also teach animation at Ho West Digital Arts and Entertainment. And I'm also a member of the VAF Animation Committee, Media Funds.
Hello. Hello. I'm Alexandra Mez. I'm working at uh, Binots, a VFX studio based in uh, La Hulp, then uh, Wallonia, Brussels, and Mechelen. I'm uh, in charge of the recruitment and HR, and also right handed woman, as we say. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Perrine Gauthier. I'm a producer, I've been producing animation for about 12 years. Um, Touristar is the name of our company based in Ghent, and I also have a company in France called La Cabane. Um, and two recent projects we produced were both um, created by female uh, creators. One of them is in this room and made this beautiful art behind me. It's called Loose on the Rock and it's by Brit Ras. Alrighty, I love the enthusiasm in here today and with the applause and everything. Great start. Um, so as I said before, I actually, um, I work at Digital Arts and Entertainment. Uh, we do have an animation major, which Alexandra down there does teach in. Um, however, I come from a bit more uh, of the games um, sector, but I, I found it really exciting um, and, and I really wanted to join today because there are so many overlaps when it comes to the importance of inclusivity and diversity um, and the more like socially relevant things in TV, film, games, and so on. Um, and so I really found it important uh, for us to come here today and discuss our experiences and also hear from some of you all as well. Um, before we, we go ahead and dive into the questions, uh, and remember, if you have any of your own, write them down or keep them in your brain for later. Uh, before we get into the questions, I, I did want to ask Vicky uh, if she could share her, her research. She did some research about um, inclusivity in the animation sector before she started uh, with her time at Media Arte. So Vicky, if you could just explain your research a little bit, so then maybe we all have um, a platform from which to jump on. Okay. So uh, when I was a master um, communication student, I did um, as topic for my thesis, I chose to um, research the gender inequality in the Flemish film industry. So actually the idea was to map all the movies made from 2006 till 2017 who were VAF funded and to just map the key professions, who's doing them, uh, is the director male, is the director female, and just actually to, to get some numbers because there wasn't anything out there for the Flemish side uh, of the country. And so um, the animation, I, I looked at the different, uh, I looked at animation, fiction, and documentary, but as we are here for animation, what I found it was that uh, on an average from 2006 till 2017, we could see that in key professions, and then I'm talking about director, producer, those professions, we could see it was uh, one-fifth female and four-fifth male. But I really want to stress out that this research was conducted very binary, so we're just looking at male, female, everything in between is not included simply because we don't have the data uh, to go on. So I think it's very important uh, to say that as well. Um, so yeah, that's what I, I found then. And it's already five years ago, so it's very important to keep that in mind as well, that the situation could have been, should be, or could be now very different, but um, I don't know that. <laughs> but it would be interesting to find out. Thank you so much, Vicky. Awesome, yeah, and I'm really glad Vicky brought up that point um, about, yeah, this research was done in terms of male and female. Um, kind of jumping off of that, we decided that this panel, although it's in essence about inclusivity um, and uh, diversity in recruitment in the industry, we decided that it would be best uh, for the panel to focus on gender. Um, and that being that this is not um, the most representative panel in terms of we don't have a person of color on, on this panel. And so we don't find it um, okay, I guess, for, for us to speak about that unless there is someone here to share their experiences as well. Um, we don't wanna be a mouthpiece for that at all. So this panel will focus about gender. Um, and as Vicky says, also uh, that research and a lot of research, it does cover things in terms of, of male and female and, and how many females are in the industry. It's also just as a side note, important to mention that 
that in in itself maybe isn't 100% inclusive as well because there are people who are like femme identifying um, and so on. But just as a side note, we'll focus on gender uh, here today. And so now it is time to, to jump into the questions. Um, so my first question for our panel is, what are the needs to stimulate diversity in recruitment? Um, so in your opinion, also given your experiences, what are kind of like your best practices that you've seen in terms of stimulating diversity in recruitment? And whoever would like to, to go ahead and, and take that one first, feel free. Um, I'll jump in if you want. Sure thing. Um, I, uh, what I've been finding is great value in uh, getting input and incentive from third parties when it comes to thinking about diversity, inclusivity, and gender balance. Because I think those topics are very often, at least I'll speak for myself, and I think a lot of people feel that way. There are topics that you think that you know, that you think that you're being rather good at or that you'd rather uh, open-minded in addressing and doing your best efforts. But the reality and the truth is you can always do better. Um, and if I look at our practices uh, on the Belgian studio side, we have 49% um, of male, 48% of uh, women, and 3% of non-binary people. Uh, on, in, in, on the French studio side, we have 70% of women and 30% of men. But that doesn't, I mean, nothing, none of that is satisfying to the point that you don't need to go further into your practices, I think. And so when you get the incentives of third parties, for example, VAF, uh, when it comes to us applying for uh, funding bodies um, uh, money, for example, it really helps you to question your practices and to see what else can you put in place to go further, what opportunities can you give, what, um, how can you approach recruitment differently and so forth. And so I guess one, one example I could give is um, that you apply, when you apply for funding from the VAF, for example, or Media, which is the European uh, Creative Fund, um, you need to write a diversity note, which focuses on two aspects, if I simplify, because it's a bit more than that for Media, but there's basically the content aspect, which is how your content reflects diversity and representation and so forth. And there's the team aspect, which, you know, is how, how do you describe, how do you show that your team also reflects uh, all those topics? And the thing is, diversity is so broad as a topic. Um, here we're focusing on gender balance, obviously, but it, it goes from gender to race to social background to disabilities and so forth. So there's so much more that you can always do in question. And to have a funding body um, um, encouraging you to, to think about it, 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 it might sound like it's nothing because you, you're thinking about it already, but it pushes you to think about it further. And I think it might be the same for creators and directors who also write those notes when they, when they apply for their film. And so what I also wanted to mention uh, very openly to you today is that it feels like a bit of a double-edged sword to me when I do it, um, because when you're describing your team, the last thing I want to do is list people for how different they are. You know, but you don't want to do that. So it's finding a way to tell about how you approach diversity without being in, in, in a situation where you're basically just listing um, what makes somebody's identity because a person's identity is so much more than their gender, their race, their social background, and so forth. And then there's another element that I always find tricky is the privacy aspect. And something I would love to talk to the VAF about one day, I haven't had the chance to do it yet, but if you're applying for a specific series, for example, and you're talking about the creator of that series, and the creator of that series has maybe an invisible disability. Do you want to tell that in your notes? Mm -hmm. I'm not comfortable doing that, you know. So it's something maybe, Alexandra, you might have a point of view on that because you, you read files for the VAF. But it's, it's, it's really, I think, we, I think 
what we have to be collectively careful about is that thinking about diversity doesn't make us put labels on people, which kind of feels like a reverse effect. So it's a tricky thing. Mm -hmm. It's good to think about it, um, but yeah, we just need to keep in mind that it's people we're talking about. Right. So. Yeah. And it's also, it's a really interesting point that you bring up there in terms of privacy, um, because we, our initial idea kind of to, to begin this round table was to go over numbers and statistics, but it's not always available. Um, and so I think that also feeds into the point that, okay, but how far should, should pri privacy reach? How far does it reach already? Is it always feasible? To know, um, like, how, for example, how many how many women work in so and so industry or so and so organization. So I think privacy is a really important point there. Um, but also, I think you bring up that just the importance of being aware of this and also not being complacent, um, because I think it, it can be easy sometimes for for us to do one thing and then kind of like check it off a box and mm -hmm. say that we did something. Um, but it's about like kind of a constant awareness and challenging, challenging yourself and your organization to keep up with these initiatives, I think is what, what I hear. So that's really great. Alexandra, do you want to add something? Yes, because I'm really glad that you addressed this topic um, because I also wrote something down. <laughs> um, I think it's important in every subject that to to make sure that the balance doesn't tip over. Like, I think they really mean well uh, with asking people to, be, uh, to sharpen their reflection. As you said, so it's good to make makers think about uh, their project and, and teams, etc. cetera. Um, and I know that the FAV is more into a, sensitizing people rather than forcing them uh, to cope with this issue in a very forced way. And, but with the privacy thing, I really agree with that. Um, yeah. But just, yeah, just being careful that the balance doesn't tip over. I thought, uh, but we'll, we'll wait a little bit to get to that, but the point about inclusivity being a double-edged sword, I know that's a huge question um, and something that a lot of people struggle with. Um, also, I'm no expert whatsoever, so I actually, I find it very difficult to talk about um, that, yeah, inclusion can also kind of be exclusive at some points. Uh, but yeah, great points, Alexandra. Anyone else wanna add to that? There, uh, yeah, yeah, sure thing. Um, yeah, so um, uh, we're very close to the VAF, so we kind of do the same, uh, even though we are a bit behind, uh, because we will only start with this diversity, you know, paper that has to be added to the, the files that you submit. We will only start in April, but it's the same idea. We just want to have people think about it. If they want to write that they want to have a film with all male over 50, if there is a good reason, it's fine. I mean, it's really fine. We just want to have them think a little bit further. Um, what, we, what we did at the CCA is, first we had no numbers, we had nothing. We mm -hmm. just couldn't care less about it. But then suddenly came all these women in the team. And we were like, well, we're all women and we just don't care. We have a problem. So we started, you know, counting. And so since I think it was like, uh, 2014, we started having numbers about the directors, scriptwriters, producers, and we could see that that was they were not very good numbers. Mm -hmm. And so, what actually was the problem when we when we were discussing with di female directors, producers, and scriptwriters is that they didn't feel legitimate to submit files. They just felt well, it's it's no use. It's not going to work. Mm -hmm. And so, what we did and what I think is very useful is we have to um, trust the people and say you have to trust yourself and yes, you can, you can actually submit a file and you'll see it will work. So that was my message for years and years and I, I, I'm not saying that it's, this is the reason why it worked, but last year, for instance, in long feature films, we got 50-50 uh, 
in okay. terms of directors for the first year. Wow. So it was great because um, it means that, I mean, female directors, they dare trying. And the other message was if we have two uh, projects that are equivalent in terms of quality, we have to favor the female one. Uh, it's, it's dangerous because we really need to be sure that we're taking quality as the first, you know, right. the first aspect. But then, then yes, we, have, we, we really had to say, okay, you guys in the commission, you have read all the projects. These two are in balance. If there is one which is coming from a female director, let's try this one. Mm -hmm. and then and then that's how we got those numbers but uh, now we are like it, it depends from one year to another this year for instance we have a little bit less I mean this year 2021 a little bit less female directors in long feature films that have been granted a, a subsidy but more in short feature films mm -hmm. um, so it's you know it's a balance um, but I think it's really by giving the message that if you don't try, you won't get it, mm -hmm. that uh, we can actually reach our goal. Great. Vicky Alexandra, sorry, sorry. or the other Alexandra? We yeah, have no, two no, Alexandras no, with no. very <laughs> similar names on this panel. <laughs> yes, Alexandra Morris. No, it's just that uh, also Valve, from what I see, from what I, what I capture, they're also um, promoting or making the threshold smaller. Mm -hmm. uh, to hand in files, like for example with talent development, uh, we try to address a more uh, diverse group of makers and involve them in workshops, like giving workshops, etc. So then, the first step is already has already been taken, and um, I think that's also important. And we see that female presence by hands uh, by the hand ins. Uh, are less than in the final approval. So we need to work on inflow, as you say, just mm -hmm. encourage uh, women to um, to hand in their project. But I think we see an evolution. Last year for the FAF was the best year ever in terms of female projects or like here, I also have numbers. Wait, <laughs> it's not as good as yours, but it was our best. Uh, like for the female screenwriters, um, we were up to 36%. And 47% were got approved of the, of the projects that were approved were female screenwriters. Uh, female directors were 30% that handed in the level of approval of 36 percent and these are all times best results for VAF and we hope to that we are able to continue this rising trend um, by stimulating uh, women but we see that women dare to manifest them more and more and more so we can only applaud this yep great point great point and thank you for your numbers alexandra um so just moving on um, to, so we see that inclusivity and being aware of these things, adding it strategically into our plans, uh, it's important. Um, I think a lot of us agree on that point, but it's also not easy. Um, and especially in animation and in fields where, okay, in an ideal world, um, yeah, it, we could easily make every single field and every single workplace inclusive. That's an ideal world. Um, unfortunately, it's not always that easy. Um, and so inevitably there are some obstacles in terms of inclusive recruitment. Um, and I just wanted to hear from you and your experiences uh, if there have been any obstacles in terms of inclusivity and recruitment, um, difficulty of distributing job offers or not so many, for example, women applying, if you could share some, some insight on that. Um, I think the biggest problem in Belgium is actually the shortage of uh, persons applying, artists applying. Mm -hmm. So from my experience, we really focus on the experience of the, the persons who apply, 
on their references, on their experience, and absolutely not on gender or any uh, on uh, nationality or that kind of things, uh, age. We, d we really focus on the references and the matching the job or not. Right. And um, actually, we, we took the opportunity to talk about this subject in-house with the women working at Beanuts uh, to have also their feedback and not only my feedback as a recruiter. Yeah, that's really cool. And um, actually, we noticed yeah, that there is a demand to, to have more women at Beanuts. We have uh, approximately 15 percent women for uh, 80, uh, 85 percent of men mm. and so uh, we never really focused on that because we had not the opportunity to choose the, the candidates right. but um, if we had the opportunity now with the discussion we had I think we could uh, and indeed as you said it's, it should be interesting to have a, a third party uh, feedback to to be able to manage it, it because I think that uh, the point of views and that kind of topics are really evolving, evolving uh, fast those last years. Mm -hmm. um, and in comparison with what, with what has been before, I think it's actually the right moment to talk about, uh, to think about mm -hmm. it. And, uh, and I think also more and more girls are studying in the VFX sector. And uh, mm -hmm. it should be also interesting to have your feedback, Alexandra. And, uh, and so we will re receive more and more applications from women. And what are we going to do with that? <laughs> right. Sure. It's very interesting. Yeah. It, it very much <laughs> is. Um, and I think, OK, so you are trying to focus on inclusivity and diversity. Um, what if no females apply in terms of gender, um, in terms of what, what if no females apply? What do you then do in that case? Yeah. to yeah to, to we had some ideas about it and actually we have uh, like uh, success stories uh, in our team uh, of women being there since a long time and mm -hmm. evolving and the career is very getting very very uh, interesting and what we try to do already since uh, some time is to also uh, tell the story of them and try to communicate about the success stories and highlight them and uh, and trying to give them uh, to give to all the women okay the the, the idea of okay it's possible mm -hmm. why shouldn't it be possible for me they did it and there is a place for it and uh, i think we really have to communicate about it uh, yeah. on social networks and so if no female applicants apply for example then empowerment is still definitely a route that you can go mm -hmm. yeah i also think you have to look for them harder it's, it's really something that uh, um, I've noticed when it comes to, to that is that um, if you're expecting to put a job posting and to find the right candidate for certain fields, because the biggest difficulty that we find, and maybe it's linked to our model, which is that we are a small company and we don't necessarily do the typical work in Belgium. By that, I mean that often in co-productions, um, a lot of the work that's being done in Belgium is animation. So you have a lot of great talent, uh, female and male, and others uh, in uh, the animation sector, but you have much less in other departments uh, of the, de the production process. And those are the ones where we try to push um, boundaries. So for example, at the moment, I'm recruiting storyboard artists, which is a challenge in itself, <laughs> male and females in Belgium, and especially in Brussels and Flanders. Um, and I, no only and hopefully I don't hopefully you know I don't know everybody and hopefully I will meet more but at this point I know two female storyboard artists which is crazy um, and I'm talking about series here I'm not talking about short films which is of course quite different because on short films often the writer storyboarder and director is often the same person or more or less uh, but on series it's uh, it's quite appalling and I think there's two reasons for that. The first reason is an industry reason, because like I said, most of the time people go to Belgium for animation and sometimes design and other things, but not never really specifically focusing on pre-production and storyboard. Um, and the um, other reason is probably coming from education. I'm looking at you guys. 
<laughs> uh, I think we need to have more training for storyboard artists in Belgium and other areas as well, like script writing, because the side effect of, of that is further down the line, it means there's going to be less female directors as well. Because of course, even though storyboarding is not the only way to get to directing, it's one of the ways, especially in series, which is a huge market and opportunity right now, especially with the streaming platforms. I mean, there's really an opportunity there for everyone. Um, so I think if we could push uh, those departments further, we would really be able to uh, build a bigger pool talent. And if we build a bigger pool talent, there will automatically be more women. Mm -hmm. And I mean, yeah, I was talking about these two storyboard artists. So one of them is working abroad and one of them is permanently employed in a studio. Yeah. So that's, that's how, you know, so yeah, it's, it's hard. But um, you have to look for them harder. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to find them. Mm -hmm. But maybe if you don't find them, you will meet people on the way that you can give other opportunities to. And maybe two years from now, they will be the people that, will fit that profile perfectly. Yep, sure. Jean, did you want to add something as well? Yeah, just, just to complete what you were saying. Uh, yeah, I think the other thing is that you need to have role models as well. You, you, you need to have teachers in school that you can relate to and say, oh, oh, OK. Oh, she's done that. Oh, uh, oh maybe I can try as well. And so I know it's going to, I mean, it's going to take time. But it's also a good way to have women think about careers that they wouldn't have thought of if they hadn't met anyone that would have done the same job. So I think it's, it's important. And um, um, I think when you say you have to look for them, you're right. You really have to go and try to see where they are. And what we've noticed is uh, usually, I'm not saying in all cases, but usually when the producer is a woman, they, they, you know, they tend to go and find more women for the crew than men would do. So usually with a, a female mm -hmm. producer, the crew is more female than in other cases. I'm not saying it's always the case, but it helps. Mm -hmm. Can I, and also what you said, we are trying to do the same thing in uh, at school now yeah. uh, to highlight, Ellie is gonna do that, yes. uh, female alumni so that we can recruit more girls. I see there are girls from the school. <laughs> uh, That's awesome. But I think this would be helpful, uh, or maybe later you can talk about it, mm -hmm. um, just to, st to show that it's possible, as you both mm. say. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's a good way to try to do it, and also the way you profile yourself on the on the website, for instance, that it's not only first-person shooters and, and, and robots and tanks, and, and, and there are also, I see that you agree, that there are also more things that appeal to, uh, to a more feminine audience and, and that you want to dive into that industry. Mm -hmm. uh, because when I started, um, when dinosaurs could talk, <laughs> uh, I, I have been in production uh, for 15 years. I was the only girl in production, 15 years. And this is a big thing, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and I cannot imagine, because now when I step into studios, I see that there's a big difference already. So there, change is coming. Um, and also in school, uh, now we have an animation major now, uh, so we have different majors, and we see in game development, mm. almost no girls, uh, and now in animation, we, we attract m far more girls, and I think that the technical side, also I started as a, as a 2D animator, um, and when 3D became a thing, there wasn't really a school for it, so it was self-taught, and now you have schools, and, and I think that uh, sometimes the technology fr I mean, frightens, not really frightened, but how do you see, scare um, them off? Yeah, like um, a little bit. Intimidates them. Yes, yeah. yes, and it shouldn't because it's really cool to do. Um, so, voila. So, these are the things that we are trying to do, and we let it grow. Uh, and we come in the beginning when I was teaching. 
Uh, we were lucky to have one or two girls in the course, and now I think it's like one third already, something like that. So I think we're growing, and, and I hope we can deliver <laughs> mm -hmm. what you need <laughs> yeah. uh, in production. It's fascinating when, when I heard Alexandra actually share that earlier, that for 15 years, she was the only female in production. And then I asked myself, well, okay, but why are we in a different space today? I mean, it, it, it's wonderful that we are. Of course, we still need to to improve. But I asked myself, like, why? Is it is it more inclusive today? Why is there more representation? And I think a lot of it, it's not the only piece, but a lot of it comes down to education. Um, and so it's also something that, that we need to reflect on also in terms of our marketing and our recruitment, just like as you say. Um, I know, yeah, game development is much different than animation. We... Alexander, I think you would agree, have many more female students in animation at this point, so, so it's a great sign. But just super interesting to think about uh, the importance of education kind of as like the, the origin of, of all of this. So I just looked at the time, and time is already flying by. So we are going to skip ahead to the next question. Um, and so... We've talked about why it's important, um, but not so much in terms of content. So I'm wondering how, uh, in which ways inclusivity and a focus on inclusivity and representation, how that might inf uh, impact content um, and also how it might affect the work environment. So we have two, two kind of parts to this question. How can inclusivity affect the content that, that creators make and also the work environment? So feel free to, uh, whoever wants to take this one. Um, well, I think it has a huge impact on content because it has direct impact on the stories people tell. Um, I, I mean, we all know that stories and creation comes from many places. It comes from who you are as a person and your background, your education and everything else. So of course, gender and your all, everything that forms your identity is going to, um, uh, come through in your work one way or the other so it has for sure a huge impact on the content and the stories we're able to see as viewers whether or not you have female script writers uh, and female directors behind uh, behind the camera or behind the animation so to speak so yeah it, it's 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 immensely important and in terms of the work environment too and there I can maybe share a little personal experience, which is not the most fun, um, but, uh, and without going into too much details, but I have worked on the, um, when, before I was working for my own business, I worked at a studio where I witnessed and, and saw how awful it could be to be on the production um, where there were a real heavy boys club and a very toxic environment of uh, going up to the point of female characters of the film being referred to as sluts. Sorry, excuse my French, sorry for the language, but that's how far it can go when there's a toxic environment because in that case there were just not a lot of women on the team and it would have been very different if there had been. I'm not saying it's like that every time there are men on the project, very luckily, but it was the case on that project and many women suffered from it because when you're on a daily basis going to work and hearing your colleague refer to the main character in, in those words, uh, you just, I don't know, it just creates a, an, an environment where you just don't even, you know, you don't even want to go to work anymore. Mm -hmm. So of course it has a, a huge impact on the work environment. But then again, um, having more women in the office or in the studio does not mean that you should not uh, look at those topics anymore. I think that's also something that mm -hmm. I've been thinking about recently because it, on the French stu studio, like I said before, we, we have 70% of women, so it's quite a lot. But we, there's an initiative we wanted to put in place and, and we are in the process of doing it. It's happening next month um, in France now to apply for uh, funding. Uh, we have to, every producer has to follow a training section against um, sexual, uh, sexist and sexual misconduct at work. 
So I did the training like every other French producer who applies for money from the CNC. It's a two-day training and then you have a test at the end, which you have to pass. <laughs> but it's not as she easy. Passed. It's not as easy and that's what I meant before is even when you think you know the subject, the reality is you don't and you learned a lot about what the responsibilities are as an employer, um, what the rights are for the uh, employees and so forth. So I think the biggest challenge and the biggest takeaway for me is never think that you know enough. Mm -hmm. And so this got me to think, okay, now I know more about my place as an employer and a, as a business owner, but it's not. It, it felt like it wasn't enough. So we had the idea of doing the same training, but for employees. Uh, so it's happening in three weeks. And so for half a day, we have the same association uh, coming into the office and doing the training to the employees. And it's something I would love to do in Belgium as well. We haven't mm. yet looked into the similar associations, but I think, uh, you know, it's not because you have 70% of women at work that you shouldn't look into those uh, subjects either. First of right. all, because sexist and sexual misconduct is not only against female. And secondly, because it helps everybody to think about, you know, how we behave and, and our rights and our responsibilities. And so mm -hmm. That is such a great point. And I also think it, it speaks to, yeah, if these things affect content, then inevitably it'll, it'll impact the work environment and vice versa. Those two are super interconnected. Anyone else would like to add anything about, about that? Yeah, sure oh. thing. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to say about work environment, it's true that we never had to face problems related to uh, sexism or that kind of things. But uh, well, I think the question can come and indeed it is interesting to, to keep uh, being updated about it. And about content from our, for our company, it's more about creative. I mean, we, serves, we often do the separation between creative and technical and it's true that women are more often labeled as creative, men as technical, and actually it's absolutely not right. Mm -hmm. And when uh, I have a look at the panel of all artists, it's totally wrong to think men are more technical, women are more creative. We have uh, both skills in uh, all the panel of, uh, of gender we have. It's also a great point that Perrine mentioned that it doesn't always have to include women. So that's that's, a really important mm -hmm. point that I mm -hmm. think we should be aware of, um, especially on this all-woman panel. <laughs> <laughs> Jean, go ahead. Yeah, um, yeah. I, uh, just not to repeat you, but uh, of course I think it affects the content because the way women tell a story, even though it's the same story as a man, it will be told differently and that's what's interesting. Um, we will we will have this teaching session in in the French speaking part of the country okay. for producers. It will not be mandatory at first because they were they were all scared. We were like, uh, I don't want to go, yeah. um, but we want to convince them that it's interesting to go. So the for the first year, they they will have the opportunity to follow this session of uh, you know. It's just as you said. It's just as an employer. You know, what do I need to know about a set if something happens? How am I responsible? So it's just those legal questions, but are, they are really interesting. And then afterwards, if we see that producers are not very keen on going, we will, we will make it uh, yeah. mandatory then. <laughs> so. and, and let me tell you, when you do attend the session, you feel that it's very much needed. Yeah, yeah. There are some really... Um, what word could I use? Um, really astonishing reactions within the audience and within the people taking mm -hmm. the training. Yeah. We see it as a waste of time and so forth. Sure, yeah. So I think that also speaks to the importance of making these things actually mandatory in some cases. And the importance of a round table like this. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> and the importance of us sitting here right now. All right, awesome ladies. So my next question for you um, is, is one that we alluded to a bit earlier, but I think is really important. It's also not an easy one to answer. Um, and it's about inclusivity. Um, to some, this might be, inclusivity is kind of like a, a double-edged sword to some people, it seems like, um, in which if you 
go and make extra efforts to include a, a certain demographic of people, it inevitably excludes another group. Um, so I want to hear from you, uh, ladies, about inclusivity um, and, and its ability to actually be exclusive uh, in some instances, if that's something you find a, a valid argument, if it's something you don't. Um, and again, um, it's also very important for, for me to mention this roundtable discussion, we aren't trying to push any agenda. <laughs> this is just for us to have just an open, honest conversation about the things that we ask ourselves and ask other people on, on a very regular basis. So inclusivity being exclusive at some, at some points. It's yeah, kind, It's kind of tricky because uh, we are really looking for, for talents mm -hmm. and uh, what's important is the skills, the soft skills, the personality and the, the, the feeling we have with the person, uh, imagining if the person is matching the team or not. And uh, it's difficult to exclude someone just be because of the gender. I can't imagine that. And when we talked about uh, that topic on Friday with the, the girls at the studio, actually the reaction of some of them was, I just want to be judged on my skills and my talent and not on my gender. Yeah. So don't look at me uh, as a woman, just look at me as an artist. And... Uh, so it's very, very tricky. <laughs> so again, judging on the quality, not completely excluding gender, but you you judge on the quality first mm -hmm. and foremost. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, right I think on. we just need to get to a place where we don't oppose. And I know that's mm -hmm. that's not the idea, obviously, because um, I, I see the practical reality of what you're saying, like I said before, with the storyboarding. Um, but we just need to collectively get to a place where we don't need to choose between the two, uh, mm -hmm. you know, where we have... We create, as producers, as studios, we create enough opportunities for women um, and many other people, um, and that schools create enough uh, training for those people to get to that level. And then we just, I, I mean, I know it sounds like a bit of an ideal scenario, but I think we can get to that place where we don't need to choose and we don't need to oppose okay. skills and gender. And by the way, women are very skilled. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because yeah, when you ask that question, actually, it comes across like you have to choose one. Yes, um, and that's totally not the case. Mm. Yeah. And also, as a as a as a woman, uh, I would feel really humiliated if they hired me because I'm a girl. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm like uh, what? <laughs> I'm a number. Yes, it's also a question yes. of like a of a token diversity and inclusion as well. Yeah. You know? really I'm going to say something very pr provocative, but sometimes it's easier to say I've not I've not been chosen because I'm a woman mm -hmm. than to really think about yeah. our own, yeah. you know, lack of competence or skill in mm -hmm. one area, mm -hmm. for instance. And so it really it requests some <laughs> some intelligence to think. Well, no, actually, I wasn't the one. Mm -hmm. It's not because I'm I'm a woman. It's just because yeah. I'm, you know. Right. And um, I, I've heard sometimes, you know, women saying, oh, my project wasn't supported because I'm a woman. And that really, that drives me crazy mm -hmm. because it's not the case. It's because there were other projects that were better than yours. And um, I don't think that any great female director really would like to say that her projects were supported because they were women. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, as you said, it's, yeah. it's humiliating. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, the big female directors, they made their films because their films were going to be great and everyone mm -hmm. thought that they needed to be financed. Point. Yeah, it's a great point. Yeah. <laughs> All right to everyone. So um, continuing, actually, I'm, I'm, let's go to one last question um, because we do have a few minutes left and then we'll, we'll head into the audience Q&A if that is okay for everyone. Um, so we covered the, the, the topic of inclusivity as being a, a double-edged sword. Um, you ladies have, have been doing some really wonderful things on the topic of inclusivity um, in your own studios, in your own organizations, uh, or in education as well, importantly. Um, and I want to hear just a little bit about 
your personal projects, uh, any productions that you've done that you would like to highlight, um, any, any kind of like success stories that you would like to share today during the round table. So whoever would like to, to, <laughs> to plug right. their successful um, stories, yeah. go ahead. Okay, um, I'll try to be brief. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll talk about um, the beautiful artwork behind me. Um, so Loose on the Rock is a film that is selected here, that is written and directed by Brit, who's in the room, uh, who's a woman. <laughs> I said that already. Um, no, more seriously, there's one aspect of the film and of the characters that I wanted to bring up as an example of something that I strongly believe in. Uh, I think when we talk about diversity, I personally like to talk about diversities. Don't know if it works in English, but it works in French. Mm -hmm. Les diversités, um, which I find even more uh, relevant and stronger because at the end of the day, uh, I find that div diversity is at this it's best when it reaches to universality. And by that I mean not that, n not when content becomes so neutral and mainstream that it's universal and that it's for everybody, but when different people can see different things in it. And I think uh, Luce on the Rock does that very well. And I'll take the example of Luce, uh, the character of Luce herself. Um, so unfortunately she's not here. <laughs> bit of a bummer, uh, but you can go see the film on Wednesday afternoon and you will see what I mean, or you can see the character around here. Um, Luce is a little girl who, ha who wears an outfit that depending on who you are and depending on where you come from and depending on what your cultural references or whatever uh, references are, uh, you might see her outfit as uh, either a dress with a hoodie, or you might see it as a cape like a red riding hood, or you might see it as a a raincoat, a ciré from Bretagne, or you might see it as a chador or hijab, because she basically has this overall outfit, um, a bit like her mom. You see her mom there. It's, it's not loose, but it's a bit the same. And it was really nice to see that, depending on, uh, yeah, depending on the people, whether they were members of the team or others, they were all seeing something different in that character and in that outfit. And that's what I really, yeah, I think that's the, the kind of diversity that I love is when it can be universal in, in such a way. So that's something that I enjoyed very much. Great. And, and really awesome to have uh, the director in this room as well. She's very exciting. Whoop, whoop. Alrighty, wonderful. Would anyone else like to, to share anything? Vicky? Yeah, um, I would love to share something as well. Uh, I think if it, we're talking about inclusive recruitment, something that we put a lot of effort into uh, at Mediarte is our job platform, where we put a lot of job offers. And I think a part of inclusive recruitment is also making job offers visible, that people can find them to get them out of this informal network bonding uh, way of finding a job. So at Mediate, we actively um, encourage employers to put their job offers on our websites so that they are visible to all and that everybody can apply if they would love to. And I think that's a very important uh, point in this discussion. The pad needs to be open to all. And whether people choose to go that pad or to choose that pad, that's up to them. Mm -hmm. But to me, it's, it's very important that you know it's accessible, it's reachable, it's out there and the opportunity is there whether you have a network or not. Mm -hmm. It also, it goes back to Perrine's point as well about so finding women for these roles. Uh, we also have to go out and look, and I think it's really great what Mediarte is doing to make it more accessible for all kinds of people to be applying for these things. Awesome, thank you, Vicky. Anyone else would like to share? Yeah, sure thing. Um, so just to say that uh, apart from the uh, diversity sheet that we will add to the files that you, you submit at the uh, Commission Cinema um, from April, we will also have, uh, we will start a new system of um, diversity coaching. If you get um, a grant for script writing, you can get uh, a coaching uh, made by a woman who's a diversity expert and she will just talk to you about the project and, and you know just help you think about what 
could be or couldn't be changed about the project? Have you thought about having a female instead of a woman? Have you thought about this and this? Or I see that you've written this this way, be careful because it might not be understood the way you want mm -hmm. it and so on. So I don't know if it's going to be useful, but at least we try and then we will see. Mm -hmm. So it will uh, we will have a first um, pilot experience of one year. We also, we will start a cycle of conferences, online conference, uh, conferences on lunchtime uh, for an hour about several subjects such as, uh, um, I don't know the word in English, colonization. Colonization. Colonization, yeah. that's it's not that hard. Um, about um, aging in, uh, on the screen, about all those subjects just for an hour by different experts. and. You just listen to it and you, you make your own, you know, opinion and it's just little stones that we put on, on the path and then we will see where it will lead us. Super great to hear. The coaching initiative, I think that's, yeah, it's also, it plays largely into the, the idea of mentoring and empowering. So that's, that's really exciting to hear. I just wanted to share um, something about recruitment. Uh, actually, we've been hiring uh, those last year several artists uh, via the media stage uh, or from Mediarte. And actually, I think they are now promoting since a few years that kind of internships in schools. And uh, we've got several success stories uh, at Binots of uh, young artists starting at our place uh, with an internship of three months and staying there for years. So uh, I really encourage uh, young uh, guys and girls uh, go coming out from school to make an internship to really uh, try to have a first uh, step in the industry and to take the opportunity to do it because it's very, very uh, useful and grateful. And, uh, and we also found very good talents via that system. So I hope it would last long. <laughs> Great. Any other last words before we then jump into uh, if any of our lovely audience has any questions? Alexandra? Yeah, I just wanted to add to that that uh, in our school, uh, the internship is a very big deal. They also have like 12, 15 weeks. We have one ten years. Yeah, I know. <laughs> small world, eh? Yeah, it's a small world. But I think that's really, really great because it's not for a month. Yeah, indeed. It's important to have a long internship. Voila, then you can grow into a company and they can see different opportunities mm -hmm. or maybe maybe you enter for one role and then you roll into something else. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think yeah. that's really And they important. can really, really jump in the production and yeah. not just look what the others are doing. Voila. They can also participate. Mm -hmm. yeah. So as I said before, um, none of us are experts in this area, we're all just navigating this together. Um, and kind of in the, in the sense of that, we also want to hear from you um, and, and see what kind of discussions we can have as well. We have a little bit of time for, for an audience Q&A. Um, so if anyone has any questions, if they'd like to share anything, maybe that's, that's worked for them specifically, uh, now would be the time uh, for that. Yes. Um, so you were talking about invisible disabilities as well and I was wondering if you should bring it up in an interview because it's like important to know if there's something that like uh, doesn't help you in the industry but also you don't want to be like not picked or picked just because of your disability so I was also wondering mm -hmm. like how do you go with that as like the one who's getting yeah. to interview you. Uh, in the in the case that I was referring to, um, the per I, d I didn't know it initially, mm -hmm. and I really didn't mind that I didn't know it. Um, mm -hmm. But I was also glad that when once the relationship was built and the trust was built, that that person felt comfortable to share it with me. Mm -hmm. And it obviously it didn't change anything to the work relationship, mm -hmm. but it was good to know because it, in a way, it also makes you. I, I won't go into too specific, mm -hmm. but just. It, helps you be aware of certain things that are good to keep in mind. So, sorry, it sounds a bit like a cryptic answer, but <laughs> <laughs> it's just, again, the privacy thing uh, is a bit touchy. Um, so I think it's it's good to know, but I think it's mostly up to the um, person applying to know whether or not they want. Uh, me, as an employer, I would never say, I think the person should say or should not say it. I can give another, another example. I 
worked last year with an animator who had severe headaches, like very severe headaches. Mm -hmm. And he didn't tell me initially. And then I found out throughout production and it meant that he had to take quite a bit of time off sometimes. So it was something that we had to deal with in the production. And I'm not going to lie to you, it was not easy. Um, but on the other hand, I understand that he didn't tell me initially because he probably felt that it would have maybe impacted my decision. So I, I'm, I don't have a firm opinion of, on whether or not it should be said in the first place, but I do think it's great that people are, are feel comfortable to share afterwards. Okay, thank you. Do you think it could also play into like the, the work environment that you create? Um, so if you maybe like cultivate an environment in which they feel like it's okay for them to, to share these things, sure. then that could be a way. Yeah, yeah. Because, because I agree, it's a really difficult situation with privacy. Yeah, yeah, and, and in some cases it does impact the work, so it's not like it's a complete private matter. I mean, it's private, but it also has, it comes into the workplace. Right. I don't, I don't think there's one answer to it. Um, I think the best answer is to be a good human being about it. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Just to complete what you were saying, we, we had, a, a I wouldn't say a case, but an occasion of, um, we had a, a job that was only open to people with disabilities. And it was very strange because at the ministry, you have those kind of uh, jobs, but you cannot ask any question that is relating to the disability. So we were having this great applicant talking and talking and then suddenly she said, are you gonna talk to me about what I have? What is my problem? <laughs> because you're not asking anything about it and it's really important. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> yeah, if you wanna talk about it, go ahead. But I wasn't allowed to ask any question and sometimes it makes people feel very uncomfortable. Yeah. So w you really need to see, you know, how they feel, and it's not easy. But I hired her, and she's just fantastic. So. Great question, by the way. Yes, I see a question over there. Uh, well, it's it's n not really a question, but just adding to our conversation. Sure. Thank you all for that. And it goes with what just was said, and it's about data collection. I just wanted to let you know that the European Agency for Human Rights did uh, a few years ago, I read it in French, but I'm sure because it's the European Commission, it's in many languages, about data collection. Because most of the time, it's a very sensitive, it's always a sensitive subject, mm -hmm. but most of the time I feel it's sensitive because we make a confusion between database so you cannot have like this person is tick, 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 and statistics, statistics about a group of person that we don't identify exactly who is what. And in that group of person, this is the, the different identities that we have. So that my kind of answer, and it's like a 25 pages about orientation on how to collect data that has to do with equality. It's a very, for wow. me, it's like one of the most important <laughs> documents in, the, in, my, in my field because I'm a diversity uh, expert myself. And uh, when you do that, I feel, um, so if you want to know about, because someone, you don't want the people to go, to, to come out about whatever their struggles, identities, and, and whatever. But I feel that having anonymous questionnaire like, and people can just answer whatever they want without putting their name on it, uh, completely anonymous, but at least you have an idea. And it also helps for the disabilities because most of the disabilities are invisible, actually. It's like 85%, I think, something like that. We always think about wheelchair. <laughs> wheelchair is like very, <laughs> very important topic, but it's a tiny number of people. Invisible disabilities is important numbers and also people who have uh, struggle with their health without being labeled as disabled. So the work environment, I would be really curious for the one who are recruiting, how are you thinking about like work hours or you know all different aspects that would make it possible for someone who is in the spectrum of health, of, di of neuro, like someone who's neuroatypic or whatever to be able to, to work because from what I see, the nine to five hours from Monday to Friday doesn't really work well for a lot of people who are super talented 
and we are missing opportunities there. And also in terms of gender, we're missing opportunities. So yeah, actually I had that question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Very helpful, very informative. Yeah, it doesn't need to be a question necessarily. Yes, right over here. Wait, I'm just going to, yeah. So uh, I am an, an animation student who happens to be female and my question is, I'm sorry, we don't hear you very well. You don't well. hear me. Oh. Is it okay if I take it's, it's okay, it's yeah. okay. <laughs> so, um, uh, okay. Uh, I am an animation student at COSC who happens to be female. So my question for you is, uh, do you think you, as a female personally, you had to work harder and work more uh, throughout your career to get where you are now, just because you're a woman as opposed to your male colleagues? I see Alexandra very enthusiastic about this one. <laughs> well, so enthusiastic is not the right word. <laughs> uh, very <laughs> leaning towards the microphone. Yes, because it was like that. Because, yeah, because I was the only girl it, I, in the beginning. I had to work twice as hard to be taken seriously. Mm. And now? And now, no, now it's gone. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It has changed, but uh, in my time, it was like that when I was like 22 or something, so 28 years ago. <laughs> so it was like that, and I had to prove myself. And even though there were boys who were less skilled, they were never questioned, but I was. Mm -hmm. And this wasn't really nice. But it faded away during the course of uh, my career. Uh, you just show what you can, and, and, and now it's accepted like this. Does anyone else have anything to add to that? I think hopefully it has evolved. Uh, I don't yes, know. I, uh, I, see. I guess it depends also on the, the fields and the departments and the industries that people are in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think I really had to fight harder than a man, but I was, um, I got the trust from men easier than from women. Mm -hmm. You know, there I were people pushing I me, the same. and those there are a the men and not the women. So I think we, we kind of need more solidarity mm -hmm. between women. Yeah. Again, that also goes back to the maybe like importance of empowerment and mentor mentorship among women. Mm -hmm. So very interesting point. I had the same experience, but a long time ago. So I hope it has changed. <laughs> <laughs> Great question. And we wish you the best of luck at CASC. Oh. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> you can do it. Any more questions, comments? Feel free. Yeah, sure thing, go ahead. Hi, um, I, uh, my name is Geraldine and I am an animator and uh, I think about the, the thing you say about role models yeah. and uh, that uh, when I uh, studied uh, we had uh, only male teachers and uh, also we studied only uh, male filmmakers and I never heard about Alice Guy uh, before a year ago and when I finished my studies <laughs> so and uh, now I am a teacher so uh, we are organizing a round table about inclusivity in uh, my school. So uh, we are inviting uh, f uh, female and uh, trans and non-binary filmmakers and uh, also uh, people from the association l -Tool. And we thought that maybe it would be cool to have a producer in our crew, so maybe Perrine, if you are interested <laughs> <laughs> in uh, participating in another round table in La Cambre. <laughs> With pleasure, as long as it's not in March, because I have a super heavy deadline in uh, March. <laughs> it will be in October. Okay, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> wow. Thank May you. I ask which school is it? You s uh, uh, La I, I studied and I am teaching in La Cambre. Ah, okay, okay. So, uh, very just interesting. Next yeah. 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 Wow, good for you. That, that's Thank you. Really <laughs> fascinating. Thank you for sharing that. Um, hello, um, I'm a I'm an animator student and in ArtFX. And um, I realized that uh, we also have a lot of male teachers. And uh, sometimes we struggle with, uh, with um, the gender differences. Like um, there was this time um, 
we were making a, a project when we had to choose a director and a co-director. The director was a male, <laughs> and uh, he wasn't that good, but people liked him more. And uh, the co-director was a girl, and she had uh, very good ideas, but uh, he was uh, more listening to the male. And sometimes when the girl was trying to speak, he was mocking her, like openly mocking her, like repeating, but uh, with a lot of sarcasm. And have you had to deal with this? And how did you deal with this when uh, you used to work yeah. with people like that? Great question. And I'm sorry that that happened. Actually, I, I never experienced really that, uh, or, or not related to gender especially. I think, uh, yeah, it's more linked to personality, or, but from my experience. So, so I, can't, I can't really uh, tell. No, it, it makes me think about the example I was giving earlier about the toxic feature film that I will not give a title to. Um, <laughs> If, yeah, I I see. I mean, I saw what you described by so many times on on that film, and uh, yeah. um, there's it's especially this um, how do you call it? This kind of group effect that you can have also that is very, very damaging, and that's why you know now we talk about boys club, which is an image of that, but it can be something else than boys. But this group effect can be so. Uh, can be causing so much damage, and probably in a different environment, that you know that person that you're um, the, the the director mocking that person, maybe he would not have acted like that if it was not in that context. I think there's also a certain context that pushes that kind of behavior even more, um, and it's horrible that that happens within a school uh, context. Yes, but it, it wasn't exactly the the director; it was. The ah, okay. Was, uh, the yeah. teacher was listening to the. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Revolting. Yeah. And we thought about talking to the director uh, of the school, and uh, but it didn't. Yeah. It, it yeah. But yeah. linked to gender or to personality, right. it's not acceptable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a toxic person. Yeah. If I may <laughs> add, also, I think, again, in education, it's important that there's also like a role. Um, like structurally, structurally, that there's also a person or people that you can go to to talk about those mm. things, because mm. yeah, it it happens in in animation, for example, but it it also happens in all different sorts of educations and everywhere, unfortunately. So I think that it's also why it's it's important to have those people or organizations in place within education, so you can go to talk to those people, and then they can maybe you know convey the the situation with the higher ups um yeah, yeah you're right because otherwise well it's the same as when you're a victim of sexist or sexual misconduct you don't dare to go speak up mm -hmm. um so yeah and it would be great to find out if you there's somebody like that at the school um, yes so since school is the start of everything mm -hmm. if you are not uh, appreciate at your right value yeah um how can you take the courage to speak to people about your project mm -hmm. because you think you won't be taken seriously. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's a big problem, but I felt like n nobody really took it seriously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's such a shame. Yeah. But it, it, yeah, I think it's also, it's equally as important that you share this now. And yeah, I also commend you for, for sharing it now because it's important to share these things that, that don't go so well in order for us to take a look and then change, you know? So thank you for sharing. Thank you to, uh, for listening to me. <laughs> yes, <laughs> hello. Um, I'm listening to, to what you, you told here and uh, I'm coming from another s sector. I'm working with uh, 3D, not animation, but uh, 3D modeling and we produce uh, medical devices. But um, what I agree totally that the mix of women and, and uh, men is very important while we're thinking on another way. Uh, uh, women have some um, other uh, priorities. 
with the children and we need to learn. Certainly I'm older than, than, than you. And uh, we in the, in the time, I had to learn to, to manage also the, the women in, in, in the office. And um, my question was for, uh, we recruit in my company uh, also students to learn from the student to go in the active world. Is there also an opportunity uh, for young, uh, for example, my daughter is here, <laughs> uh, to, to learn how is the business working and after the, after the studies she can she have more experience? So any like organizations or programs you mean to give female uh, like students? A, like uh, student uh, jobs? Uh, that, they can, that she can do in the, in, in the holiday time. But I do this with, with other person. They, they, they come to my office uh, in, in, the, in the student time and mostly we, we, uh, we take these people in the team after. Mm. Internships uh, from school are, are possible. Normally schools organize internships for the l last year. And uh, this year we had also a lot of uh, requests from uh, uh, students in uh, the back, the, the last year Reto, the last year in secondary school, mm -hmm. and they come just to look at what we do. They spend one day, two days uh, at the office, and they just look at the, what the artists do. So uh, yes, we, we, what we what we mostly do, we we bring the students inside of the production, and after they learn it and we see that uh, they, they are very motivated uh, mm -hmm. and then they, they can jump either in my company or either in another company. Yeah. Uh, she is uh, in, in, in Genk, in St. Lucas in Genk. Uh -huh. yeah. But perhaps yeah. we, you can talk with her. <laughs> Thank you so much. Any other questions? Comments? All right. If no other questions or comments or, or anything like that, thank you so much uh, for coming and joining us here today. Um, again, I think it's really important that we start with these conversations um, and that we just, again, we aren't experts. We're all navigating this together. So I think the most important thing is that we begin to look at this um, and, and reflect together about what we can do in terms of inclusivity going forward in the, the animation sector and beyond. I also want to thank my lovely panelists, a big, can we do a round of applause for Jean, Vicky. For Jean, Vicky, Alexandra times two, and also for Perrine, thank you so much for sharing your, your insights here. Very much appreciated. Uh, if you have any questions for, for us, um, I think some of us will also be around um, at Anima a bit later on. But um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you so much for coming and enjoy the rest of your, oh, yes, yes. You hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. Just one last thing, if you ask me to pronounce names of the great uh, artists uh, in animation in Belgium, my first one is Kim Kekeler, Guillaume Leroy, and uh, uh, Emma, uh, Emily Peters. We, we have a lot of uh, great women in animation in Belgium. Yeah. Uh, Zoe Hardy. <laughs> I, I have a, a big test. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's a great way to end it. And, and I, think, I, I think that's a, a perfect of, ending. A big list. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>